Hey, we have uh, three uh, presenters from uh, Docker Committee, uh, Shared Committee, and Public Committee. And unfortunately, uh, OpenStack County uh, Field cannot make it, but uh, uh, he will come to Japan tomorrow. So we, he will make a presentation at the uh, Latin Technology Conference. Uh, this uh, is a kind of pre-event of the uh, Latin Technology Conference. It is as annual uh, technology conference uh, supported by Lacten. And uh, you may know that Lacten is a very crazy company and uh, our official language is not Japanese but English. So, you know. <laughs> 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 it is really, really. Anyway. Uh, oh, oops. I'm not good at uh, Microsoft. <laughs> okay, uh, committee meetups. And uh, today's hashtag is Lacten Tech. So please use Lacten Tech at a uh, tweet or Facebook or Mixi. Anyway, uh, do you know Mixi Tech? <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, notice. Uh, we have uh, guest Wi-Fi. Uh, you can use event A or event G and uh, go 10.25. Go 10.25. Not 10.6. OK. Uh, we have a uh, uh, bathroom. Uh, uh, and the most important information is uh, we are sponsored by Chef. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So without their help, support, uh, we cannot have beer and pizza. <laughs> and the uh, pizza will be came and uh, uh, 7.45 or 50, so then uh, we'll have the uh, pizza party, okay? So today's uh, agenda is uh, like this. Our uh, first uh, presentation uh, will be uh, Dr. Nesan Di Kueya. So uh, please come to the end. Oh, by the way, uh, today uh, we will broadcast uh, by YouTube and uh, uh, all of presentation will be recorded and uh, uh, after that uh, uh, you can watch the presentation. So please share your friends with your friends. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, is it just VGA? Yes. Okay, I have an adapter, so. You, you have an adapter? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. <笑> oh, by the way, the sponsor of Live Creation is just to touch up. Hi, 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 I'm sorry about the uh, presenta presenting myself with the beer, but the, uh, uh, we have the uh, sponsor for the uh, beer, so uh, uh, please, uh, uh, I, I want you to understand, uh, I want you to uh, take that day at the uh, conference and uh, have some beers and uh, uh, pizza is coming over and uh, uh, please enjoy and uh, uh, thank you for the uh, having uh, this opportunity. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 How's it going? Good. Good. <laughs> good. Uh, I want to start off by saying thank you guys for coming out. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, it's really the support of the community that drives everything and makes stuff like Docker possible. So uh, I really just want you guys to know that we're very thankful that you're coming out, uh, choosing to spend your time this way, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully you will continue to choose to spend your time, uh, you know, hacking on cool stuff like this to build the future of uh, application design and delivery. So, uh, a little bit of background on who I am. My name is Nathan, and I work for a company called Docker Inc. It's a little startup out of San Francisco. And so what we do is, oh, it looks like I need to move my screen. There we go. So, so just show of hands, how many people have heard of Docker? Okay, uh, how many people actually have uh, downloaded it and played around with it? Okay, great. So, um, so basically, uh, what Docker is, is it's a Linux container technology, right? And so there's been technologies that are similar to this uh, for isolating processes, Unix processes, um, and controlling the amount of resources that they use, like CPU and memory. <coughs> And we've uh, had technologies like this for a really long time. Uh, show of hands, who knows what a CH root is? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, that general idea of stuff uh, has been around for a while. Um, but the thing is that uh, with Linux containers in particular, um, the ability to uh, take one thing and run it in an isolated way and to run it in an isolated way in a consistent way across a bunch of different places um, has sort of been something that's been very elusive uh, until really recently. And uh, to do that kind of required uh, until about you know, 18 months or so ago, uh, kind of this esoteric knowledge of stuff. Uh, you had to know how to uh, correctly say the magic invocations and get the computer to do your bidding. Um, and then Docker kind of came along and it really blew the doors wide open on uh, being able to do that for everybody. Um, so now it's, it's just a lot easier to get into and uh, the doors have really just opened right up um, in terms of what has become possible for people. And um, the thing is that uh, the future of, of where Docker is headed and, and where the sort of movement around it, uh, you know, like uh, all of the technologies in the ecosystem are headed is very exciting for everyone uh, because essentially what's going to happen is a lot of pain that was there before that made a lot of sysadmins and developers want to tear their hair out uh, now suddenly is not going to be there anymore. Um, so it's going to really open up a whole wide spectrum of things. So uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show a little bit of what Docker looks like uh, for people who maybe aren't familiar. And so a very basic Docker command looks like this. And it's Docker run. Uh, and so it's Docker run with the flag for interactive mode, which is minus i. Uh, and the minus t also lets us have a terminal. And so what's happening here is I've said, OK, create a container. So create a self-contained unit of, um, of process execution. And with its own file system, right? So I can actually see all of these things in slash inside of the container that don't have anything to do with what's happening on the host. And I've run a command inside of it, which is bash, right? And so I can do something like this which is uh, install uh, command, right? And actually, I'm going to have to append something on the beginning here, which is uh, get uh, update. No zero, because that's not right. And so, um, so when we run this, what's happening is we're actually running something inside of its own little isolated uh, thing. So um, we make this comparison to the shipping industry. And I actually saw some shipping containers on the way here. And I was like, that's a good omen. Um, <laughs> And uh, basically, the idea is you should be able to move something around really, really painlessly uh, from place to place to place, because this is this huge issue that you struggle with in application design and, and architecture. 
Um, and, you know, uh, the point of Docker, one of the most important things is you should be able to have choice, right? So um, if you use a tool like Chef or Puppet and you don't want to get rid of it, you like using that and you like the ability to specify things in, in code or in exact detail with the DSL that you're comfortable with, um, you should be able to do that. So one of the goals of Docker has always been choice, right? And so what's cool about Docker is we started with this sort of known file system state, which was the Ubuntu image. And if you see here, we can actually look at the container that we ran last. So you can see this is the container that we just ran. And if you come over here, if I can actually work my mouse, let's see. <coughs> So if I do something like docker diff of that last run container, I'll actually see all the files that change, right? So what happened was we started from a known file system state where if we run it anywhere that runs a modern Linux kernel, it will run the exact same, because it's the exact same files built on top of layers <coughs> in the new file system. And what we're actually seeing here is things that have changed, which is files and directories that are listed with a C there, and things that have been added, which are files and directories that have an A in front of them. And what you can actually do is you can take this container state, right? We can take an actual thing that represents a file system state after a process has been executed in it. And we can actually do a commit, right? So it's uh, sort of similar to what you might be familiar with from version control. And so you can do docker commit of uh, the last run container into something else. And I'm going to call it uh, Nathan LeClaire. Like, let's say I want to share this with someone else, and I want to be able to say, hey, um, download uh, Matrix Japan uh, and run it, and I want it to be the exact same as when I did it on my computer, right? So now I can do something like this. I can do docker run, nice IT, Nathan LeClaire, slash C Matrix Japan. Oops. <laughs> tag oh, Matrix Japan. C Matrix. If I can get names right, I can do awesome stuff. Right? Oh, and I want to run a specific command. Right? So what's interesting, too, to note is that I just created a container and then ran it. And think about how fast that was. So VM doesn't boot up that fast. Um, and so you'll see all these com comparisons between <coughs> containers and VMs, because uh, basically, because some people are using VMs that uh, for things that just aren't really a good fit for VMs, but there wasn't any other choice before. So um, now they have another option, and it's, it's Docker. So um, when you see people compare containers and VMs, you should all, always take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, uh, because um, they're not really the same thing, and, and containers require this new way of thinking. But um, the point is that you can take something <laughs> like this, and um, Cool. So I made this nifty C matrix app and I want to actually share with other people. So what I can do is, you know, this is another thing that was incendiary that Docker introduced. I can actually take this image and I can push it, right? And what's interesting is if you compose your images the right way, well, then you get really good transport efficiency, right? So one of the things about golden images that sucks is you don't want to actually download a new 10 gigabyte image every time you want to make a tiny little change to a file. But what you can see here is that all of these layers that already exist on Docker Hub, which is the remote that I'm pushing out to, um, they already exist. And so Docker is smart enough to know that image already pushed is already pushed to the remote that I'm trying to push to, so don't push it, right? And so I only push out that little bit that change. Right? And then I can actually go and look at it on Docker Hub and I can tell my buddy, hey, pull down Nathan LeClaire C matrix, or in a more realistic life example, hey, pull down my Java app or my Ruby on Rails code and run it. Right? And then I don't have to worry about whether my buddy has no code gear installed or he has a certain Java library that I need or this uh, subversion of a certain file and all these headers compiled the right way. I just have a Docker image that want, runs and works and runs the same way everywhere, every time. And that's what we've done with images, and that's what we want to do with infrastructure and, and multi-container orchestration across <coughs> hosts, too. So um, that's a kind of a quick little uh, just a peek into the world of Docker. And um, I don't really have a whole lot of time, but I'll be hanging around for, for the whole meetup if you want to come up and poke me and ask me questions and stuff. So uh, thanks a lot for your attention. and. Uh,
I'll read the rounds, and we have stickers also if you'd like to get your cute little Dr. Whale sticker. Uh, we're going to get to the end of the questions in that. You're okay. You're okay. What's that? Uh, questions? Yeah, yeah. Now, or anybody have questions? <laughs> Excuse me. Any questions? Maybe we, we don't need, we, we need more alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need more alcohol. Yeah. Oh, more alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> too shy. <laughs> so I'll be here if you want to ask or too many the alcohol questions. <laughs> Go for it. So, so, how do you think about um, uh, how do you think about the uh, Network virtualization uh, play together with Docker technology. So, as far as I look at the documentation and code, mm -hmm. so Docker only has um, Linux bridge mm -hmm. integration or nothing. So, if any, how do you envision how virtual networking could play well with uh, Docker technology? Right. So, um, uh, could you so repeat uh, questions? questions? Because right. the so, um, so the question was um, basically, how do you envision Docker networking working in the future? Since mm -hmm. since right now the way that it works is, uh, what you do is you create this virtual Ethernet bridge, which is called Docker Zero, and all of the containers run on that bridge, and um, it's sort of all or nothing. Uh, well, the first thing is. Um, we actually introduced new options, and it's not super flexible, but they're there, uh, where you can do things like uh, there's a minus minus net option on Docker Run, where you can do uh, Docker Run minus minus net of, uh, of host is one option, so you can just get the network stack of the host directly, and sometimes you can kind of use that to do like hacky workarounds for things that you wouldn't be able to do with like the default networking stack. Um, and then there's minus minus net container, so you can actually use the networking stack of another container too. So you can actually kind of do some tricks around that. And um, and the the real the real you know thing about that is um, it's sort of a known issue that Docker networking is not really very flexible, right? And it's actually kind of a weak point uh, in Docker. So um, so we really we really want to really buckle down on that in the future and, and come up with solutions that are, are flexible and kind of adjust to everyone's networking needs uh, because you know uh, the bridge works for J random guy down the street but it may not work for someone who's running all of their containers on bare metal in the data center that they own where they just want to keep Mesos as the source of truth and basically like give each container just one IP address that's like native and not really like deal with it or do any of the like bridging and all of the uh, stuff that Docker does behind the scenes. So um, the yeah the sort of longer answer is we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Next brief. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for your introduction. Uh, sorry that I never used Docker. So but I want to understand why it is real it's a virtual machine is a common line send is a like a software defined network uh, container. What is it really? Thank you so much. Right. So, so what is what is the what is the difference between Docker and a VM? Is that the question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, so virtual machines are actual physical emulation. Or sorry, not physical, but uh, they're emulation of hardware in the software layer. Right, so um, you are actually, you know, running the equations and doing the math to actually figure out if I was running these commands on a physical chip, what would it look like? Um, and uh, so you're actually emulating hardware inside of software with with virtualization, and, and by definition, you have to have some kind of hypervisor. It might be type one that's on bare metal, or it might be type two that sits in an OS. But by definition, you have to have a layer that actually emulates hardware. And the thing that makes container technology different is that it's not any of that at all. It's just taking advantage of primitives that are built into the kernel that allow you for, um, they allow you 
namespace control, right? So isolation of processes off into their own little certain groups where they can't come up with anything else, right? And so each container gets its own unique network namespace and its own unique uh, PID namespace, right? So it appears to only have, you know, just one process or however many the base process forks off, right? Um, and then someday there's going to be user namespaces as well, so that each container has its own unique user namespace, so that you can have root-like things inside of a container without actually being root. And um, and likewise, the take advantage of a feature called C groups in the Linux kernel that um, allows for resource control. Right. So what you can do is you can say things like this container should only ever have two shares of CPU relative to the four shares of CPU that these other containers have, right? And so um, it's uh, stuff like that that just allows you to have a finer grain control of your apps, but with almost bare metal speed, basically. Um, so one use case, for instance, is New Relic, uh, who is a application uh, software monitoring company. Um, excuse me. Um, they really had these very painful, messy deployments because they're on like four different versions of the JVM and like five different versions of Ruby. And it's just <laughs> infeasible to run all of those in their own separate, isolated virtual machines. It would just be too costly. And um, so what they ended up doing was basically leveraging Docker so that they could get post-like you know, runtime speeds um, with that sort of same flexibility. And if you architect things the right way and take advantage of the tooling around it, which is still evolving, um, then you can really get some, some good wins uh, in terms of infrastructure. So I hope that helped. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So last two questions. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, maybe uh, one week ago, I got missed that Microsoft says uh, they support uh, native uh, Microsoft Fontaine and Docker. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't <laughs> imagine that such that, that, uh, 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 Microsoft plan mm -hmm. before. So, do you have any podcasts uh, about uh, Docker <coughs> for that? Uh, that, um, does Microsoft we, uh, contribute to Docker itself and uh, they go with uh, open source? Uh, uh, maybe JIT? People in JIT are uh, familiar with Linux rather than Microsoft. So, yeah. But uh, what I uh, wonder now is uh, where Docker will go with, uh, with uh, Microsoft? Mm. Cool. So, so the question is, um, uh, so Docker and Microsoft, right? We heard about that the announcement like uh, last week, I think. Um, and how is that going to work? You know, historically, Microsoft hasn't exactly played well with open source, basically. Um, what is that going to look like? And so, um, the answer is that, as far as I understand it. Um, Right now, we're working closely with the Windows kernel developers to actually bring the equivalent of what is called namespaces and C groups in the Linux kernel to Windows. Um, and so those same primitives will exist in Windows. And, and the focus in the early days, I'm pretty sure, will be on Azure and on Windows Server. And um, and then uh, the idea is, is that they will they will contribute to Docker directly and um, basically you're going to be able to run Windows containers on the you know, uh, Windows server uh, with Docker the same way that you could run Linux containers uh, on Linux today. Um, so, so you know, to be clear, it's not really enabling anything magical where you can run Windows containers on Linux or Linux containers on Windows, but um, you know, I think, I think really what happened was Microsoft took a look at the landscape they have new management, and historically, like Satya Nadella has been very supportive of open source and done good things on the Azure team. And I think what they really want to they want to do is they want to make sure that they stay relevant in the data center. 
So um, I think that they looked at Docker and said, you know, these guys are doing something good. We want to contribute and we want to have that for Windows. And, and um, you know, they could run off and, and do their own thing, but um, well, we kind of have a saying, which is that projects are easy to fork, but communities are not easy to fork. Right, so um, I think they really were interested in, in leveraging that same momentum behind Docker instead of just running off and implementing, you know, Mocker or whatever they would call it, Microsoft. <laughs> like, um, so, yeah, but um, I know everyone at Docker, and, and I'm sure plenty of people at Microsoft too are super excited about it, and I think it would be very good. Um, uh, I do I do know at least one person you know from Microsoft that's been working on like some of the sort of like prototype future Docker stuff that we have for like brewing on GitHub that is like we're making this this is like the general direction of the future but we don't really know if this exact form will get into like Docker proper because uh, once you support something in like capital D Docker it's like very hard to get rid of. So, um, yeah, they're, they're participating in, in the future of Docker, so it's an exciting time because you'll be able to pull Windows containers too, so, yeah. So, last question? Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Good uh, command line presentation. <laughs> this is a good opportunity. So, I have a question for another, uh, another point of view. So, uh, as far as we know, so Docker is implemented to Golang. So, uh, why do you use the Golang? And the, how do you think about the Golang in your forecast? Or I, uh, already you implemented Golang? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so, the question is um, so, Docker is written on top of a language called Go, otherwise known as Golang, mostly for, for search engine purposes, uh, because Googling. Go doesn't really usually get you stuff that's very helpful. Um, uh, so the question is, is um, I, I think, why do you why use Go you and um, what do I think of it? Um, so uh, I think that um, part of the reason that they used it was it was just kind of starting to gain popularity at the time, but it also just makes sense. Um, so Go has uh, several language features that make it a very good fit for Docker and applications that are like Docker. So, um, so it's statically typed and it compiles really fast uh, and it is compiled. Uh, so you can compile it into just one single static binary, right? So you don't have to deal with Ruby or Python or any of that stuff. You just get one binary. Right, and that's really nice, honestly. To just and it has very good cross-compilation support, even though we don't always do the best job of supporting across operating systems. Um, and it has very good support for concurrency. Right, so Go provides some very powerful primitives that make it easy to work with doing things concurrently. So, for instance, in some languages, it's, it's kind of annoying to like call out to one server, and then before I get the response back from that server, call out to another one, and then call out to another one, and call out to another one, and then just sort of aggregate the responses together, uh, you know, after I've already called out to them. Because, I mean, why would you, why would you, right? Like, what, it doesn't make any sense to wait for the response to get back, and then go on to the next call, and wait, and then go on to the next one, right? So, Go was designed to solve the kind of systems engineering problems that they have at Google, right? And um, really, I mean, I think that like a lot of like Go's success boils down to like uh, two things, right? So it's really boring and it's really <laughs> strict. Um, so like the compiler will like yell at you for doing stuff like uh, define like assigning a variable and then not using it. So if you assign a variable and then you don't ever use it again, the compiler will say, nope, get rid of it. Same thing with imports. <laughs> if you import a module and then you don't use it, the compiler won't, your program won't compile. <laughs> um, so it's sort of a different, like, it's a change of pace if you're used to working with like Python or something. And I love Python and, uh, you know, uh, I love Python, but Go is really fun too. Um, and then uh, the other thing is just that uh, Go font is a thing. Right, so um, what's kind of uncanny about Go is that everyone's code sort of ends up looking the same because everyone runs it through this exact same program to like basically pretty print it. So you have Go font, right? So you, there's no more of this like 
Well, obviously, programmers who put their brace on a line that's not on the same line as the method declaration are superior, because why would you do that in Heathen? You know, um, it's just like uh, all the same. It just all looks the same, because it all gets run through GoFunds, G-O-F-M-T, GoFund. And so uh, I think GoFund is like awesome. Everyone just has it as a hook set up in their editor, so like it just pre-prints your code, and it's just like it seems like you can just get this stupid amount of stuff done with Go, uh, and you have a good setup for it. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> it's it's fast, like it's <laughs> uncanny fast, and you know, and how fast it runs. Actually, it lets you like get away with probably a little too much stuff. It's unlike in like Python or something, where it gets like really slow, really fast. Um, in Go, you're like, oh, this looks pretty quick. You know? <laughs> so yeah, it takes a second before like the computer science stuff starts catching up with you. But, you know, it does catch up. All right, so thank you guys all, all so much for coming. <laughs>
But then when you're moving into more of a VM type world, you're actually using the exact same recipes to deploy that application as you would be doing in a local development environment, right? So it provides consistency as you move up the stack uh, in your deployment cycle. Um, the other thing that Chef Container does is that it helps you address the PID1 problem. So the PID1 problem, essentially what happens is, is docker run replaces init, and whatever you specify uh, to run will actually be PID1, right? So init doesn't necessarily exist anymore inside of a, a container. So basically what we allow you to do is um, um, we, allow you, we, we give you this thing called uh, chef init, and chef init actually runs as PID1, right? And then anything that you need to spawn from, uh, otherwise from process-wise, chef init will actually do it via a, a program called run it. And I'll explain this here a little bit more in a second. So what is run it? So run it is a lightweight cross-platform init scrape, init scheme. So it's like service D, but without all the controversy. That's a joke. There we go. We got some help. Uh, so uh, Arnie's always like, uh, so Arnie, my uh, partner, uh, who I do a lot of work with, is always like, never tell jokes, Michael. They never go over very well. <laughs> and it's especially hard when it's uh, uh, an audience whose English is a second language. Um, so basically, it's something like uh, you know your BSD init scheme, service service D, or something like that. So chef init is essentially a root process which will launch and manage those multiple processes inside of the container and uh, basically ensure that they're up and running. So no matter what platform you have, inside of your Docker container, chef init will run. And every time inside of your chef recipe where you've specified service, the uh, chef init and run it will actually make sure that service comes up correctly. Uh, now, in order to do that, you actually do have to specify. Don't touch the mouse. That's I have sure. no idea what happened. Uh, that's my son, though. Uh, hiding behind sunflowers. Did it again. All right. Don't touch that button. All right. So. Uh, you'll notice, I don't have my laser pointer, but imagine I'm pointing with a laser. Um, you basically have to specify what that entry point is for that service that you want to run. So you notice that I've got this, oh, so these two match, right, one another. And basically when I say service start and service enable, that command is actually going to be ran instead. Okay, so for every service or process that you want to run, You'll have to set this up inside of what's called a first boot.json file, which your container actually uses to build. We'll talk about how you build containers right now. But you notice that we've actually got chef init running as PID1, and then chef init is able to spawn off the other processes that you want running. So you can actually have multiple processes running inside of a container. Now that kind of breaks the theory of like what you're actually supposed to be doing with containers, but I'll leave that open to debate, right? Um, so there's a new tool that we've released uh, called Knife Container. And so there's basically, if you do uh, uh, gym install knife-container, you'll get this gym, which will actually give you the command line utilities to manage Docker containers. So you notice that we didn't call it Knife Docker, we called it Knife Container, because the idea is that we'll be able to one day support other versions of containers. Although since Docker is actually supporting every type of container, and Docker is kind of the entry point to any type of container that you need, I don't really know if we need to write anything else at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Docker. <laughs> <laughs> maybe when Microsoft comes out with uh, their drawbridge project, maybe it'll be Knife Container Drawbridge, or whatever they're going to end up calling it. So when you do Knife Container Docker init, what happens is, is the um, um, Basically, the Docker context gets created. Uh, whatever base image that you need will actually get downloaded. And also, a lot of skeleton files will get created as well. Now, when you do this, you can actually specify some options as well. So you can specify the Docker, or the base image to use by default. Of course, we use uh, Ubuntu 12.04. Um, and then you can specify your run list. So what you can actually do here is say, 
that I want to run Apache, for instance, so or roll my app, right? And what will end up happening is a first boot file will get created, and this basically just creates the skeleton to then go and create the actual image itself. So at this point, you don't actually have anything except a directory with some files in it. And that directory and files kind of look like this. Uh, so you notice you've got the client.rb, which will have to go onto the container, the first boot JSON, and then also your validation pin as well. Uh, if you run Docker images, you actually do have a very base image there, but it's actually just a copy of the Ubuntu image at this point. So it's not actually, we haven't layered anything on it at this point. So if we do night container docker build, this is when we actually begin to layer things on top of it that are in, actually listed out on the docker file. So if we do night container docker build and the name of it, so in this case it would be my org slash my app, we're actually going out and actually running a chef run at this point. So if you actually had something in that run list, so that role was actually something valid that we specified before, we would actually uh, when we build the image, we would actually apply all those configuration changes. So the nice thing is, is that we don't have to write things in our Docker file to actually run commands and app get update and all of those things. We can use our recipes to actually build all of the layers inside of the uh, container. So now if you actually look at this, it's actually going to be a different image ID because we begin to layer on. So remember, uh, uh, Nathan was talking about all of the layers that you have and you'll only need the layers that where you begin to diverge from the original base image or the base container. So you notice that we've actually begun to diverge from the base Ubuntu image. Uh, and if we made modifications and if we ran Docker build again, we would actually have uh, uh, another layer that we would put on. And you can see the history of all of the different things that we do. And you notice that these are actually, you can see the chef and knit bootstraps that actually go on, and that's actually chef and knit actually is also the chef client would, would actually run and process the recipe to make changes to your container and not on the layers. And this is important because if you have um, uh, lots of layers in a Docker container, and if you change one of these layers, right, so let's just change, say that we need to say uh, step B is modified. So um, the bottom is basically the chef resources that you would call, right? To, and then the L1, L2, L3, L4 is actually if you had specified all of those things in a Docker, con Docker file directly, right? So what happens is, is say step B to deploy my application changes, I actually have to change L2, L3, L4, and everything past that point has to get changed as far as the layering is concerned. If that resource actually changes when you're using Chef Container, what you actually only have to end up doing is, is we end up applying resource one through four. So in Chef, a resource is something like a file that needs to get changed, a directory, a service, and there are all of those little bits and pieces. We would apply resource one through four, the way you originally specified, and then we can actually just go and change the one that changed and not actually have to apply everything after it. Because we would basically just do the opposite action of what you specified in R2 and basically set R2 to the way it needs to be in the current layer. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, we'll talk about it afterwards because we're short on time. <laughs> um, so some more information if you want to learn more about this and play around with it. So there's a really good video um, and you know, write all that down, right, really quickly. Take a picture, yeah, take a picture usually works better. But if you just Google managing uh, Docker containers with Chef, you'll actually get, or you know, do a Yahoo search if you prefer, um, you actually will get this uh, uh, YouTube video and it actually will explain this a little bit more in depth uh, instead of the 15 minutes that I have to spit all of this information out. Uh, there's also documentation on it as well. And then also we provide a lot of Docker images that already have the Chef components inside of them. Uh, so hub.docker.com slash u slash chef, and you can get all of our Docker base images that we provide to you. Uh, any feedback, there is a, uh, a couple of GitHub projects that uh, are open source, so this is all open source. You can download it, play around with it uh, without paying us any money. 
All right, if you want to pay us money, we have a booth back in the back where we're taking <laughs> credit cards tonight. <laughs> that's a joke. Yeah, yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have some stickers for you as well. Um, so if there's any questions, I'll be around later. We'll just take questions offline because I know we're uh, a little short on time. But thank you very much, and uh, thank you for coming. Hey. Uh, is there any uh, short uh, URL, like the tiny URL or something? No. <laughs> so the question is, is there a shortened URL? No. But if you just search managing chef containers with Docker, or I'm sorry, chef containers. <laughs> managing Docker containers with chef, you'll get several links back uh, very quickly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, one more question? Okay. Any questions? Yes. One question. Uh, one question. Can you mention uh, chef unit to be replaced? Uh, you mentioned uh, chef unit to be Chef unit to be placed uh, PID1. So yeah. how about uh, relationship with system D will be? So uh, we replace the system D with running. So we don't use system D. Yeah. Uh, we're <laughs> somebody at Chef is a really big fan of running. So yeah. yeah. So I'll be around all night, so feel free to ask questions. Okay. As you find me. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, this person is Patrick. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And then we will have pizza, right? How long do I have to talk before the pizza gets here? <laughs> I don't imagine anyone will listen when all they can smell is pizza. <laughs> Okay, oh, that looks all right. Um, let's start there. So my name is Patrick Kelso, I'm with Puppet Labs. Uh, I've decided not to give a 15 minute talk on how you can manage Docker with Puppet because we're probably all sick of hearing about Docker by now. <laughs> Sorry, Nathan. Uh, if you Google it, you will get us. And also if you Google Chef in about an hour, you'll also get us because I'm going to buy all the big ad words, so that you'll always get our answer. <laughs> So what I want to talk about very quickly is an overview of where Puppet is at today and where Puppet Labs, my employer, is in the region, in Asia Pacific, uh, particularly in Japan and based in Australia where I'm from. So very quickly, Puppet Enterprise 3.3, which was our most recent release, uh, will be obsolete in two weeks when we release 3.7. Uh, so some of this stuff is correct, but some of it is actually going to be changing. Uh, but basically, we've overhauled the installer to make it easier to install on-premise Puppet Enterprise and easier to get started adding agents in using a simplified install. Uh, we've, in, we've, excuse me, we've expanded our agent support to include uh, more versions of AIX, Solaris, and Red Hat, and we are still working on trying to get on HPUX if anyone is using that. Uh, so far, the only person I know using HP UX uh, is desperately waiting for Ruby to be available, which is what will allow Puppet or Chef or any other tool like us to run. So this is what our installer used to look like. And personally, this was my favorite installer. It was text-based, it was easy, I could SSH in and run it. Now we have a web-based installer. So now you SSH in and you run a script which opens up a web server and then you can finish the install from here. But you can still use the text installer if you have the answers file. And it just steps you through, makes it a little easier to get started on using Puppet in your infrastructure. And it also validates that Puppet is working. So the big changes we've been bringing with Puppet is expanding beyond the core Puppet infrastructure management that we've been doing. So adding in more support for external modules like the VCS repo, uh, Windows modules for PowerShell and ACLs, and going to the uh, question earlier about Docker and Windows. Two years ago, nobody really believed that Puppet or Chef or any configuration management tool would work on Windows, and now most of us are there, and companies that aren't are working on getting there as fast as they can. Uh, and adding in, as I said, newer versions of operating systems and support for OS X and Mavericks on the desktop. 
We've also made significant performance improvements and the new version that's coming out in a few weeks is even faster. So that's that presentation, nice and quick. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was Puppet Labs in Asia Pacific and I'm just going to try and make this go full screen. There we go. So a year ago, Puppet Labs in Asia Pacific had one employee, this very handsome gentleman up here on the screen, Brett <laughs> Craig. Uh, he's based out of Canberra. He came to a meetup event that Puppet was holding in Sydney, and he was he'd been using Puppet for a few years, and he came to the Puppet Labs people because they didn't have any staff, and he said, "I want to work for you." And what this photo doesn't show you is Brett's about this big, about this bulky, like <laughs> muscle. So they went, okay, you can have a job. <laughs> he now travels around. He he's ostensibly lives in Canberra, which is about the coldest place in Australia you can get. He spends maybe five days a month in Canberra, and the rest of the time he travels around training and doing professional services. After they hired him, they thought, maybe we need some, some salespeople to actually do some sales. So we got this handsome gentleman. Uh, he may have not taken his employee photo, so he gets a puppet. <laughs> Rob Finn is my partner in crime. He's the sales commercial director for Asia Pacific. He was hired at the start of this year with the goal of expanding Puppet in the region. And then they brought me on. <coughs> so uh, a lovely photo there. That was actually the day I got married. Um, so I was brought on six months ago as the technical resource because Rob doesn't understand computers. <laughs> <laughs> my job is to explain what Rob means and then Rob just takes the check and passes it off to Portland. So I'm very happy to be a Puppet. I was working previously uh, in a number of organisations trying to convince them to use Puppet because it would make my life easier. And now I just get paid to try and convince them to use Puppet. So it's a pretty good term. And finally, we've expanded. So year on year, we've gone from one person to four people. Or more accurately, we've had 400% growth in a single year. <laughs> we now have this handsome gentleman, who is our second professional services engineer. This man delivers almost all of our English language training uh, in Asia Pacific. So he ostensibly lives in Sydney, but doesn't spend a lot of time in Sydney because he's always traveling as well. So most of the time, you'll see me, uh, or Rob, who looks something like that, but maybe a little more hair. Uh, <laughs> we're the ones who do most of the traveling and presentations. But if you need professional services or you go to an English language training course, then you will see one of the other two gentlemen. So that's the Puppet Grabs employees. Now, oops, I didn't mean to cross that. Uh, I had another part. So beyond that, it's actually uh, not important to have slides at the moment. We're expanding throughout Asia Pacific. So we're based out of Australia because Australia is our fastest growing market for adoption of Puppet and has been for quite a while. Uh, Australia is a country where we adopt new technologies very quickly and easily and we always like to chase new shiny tools and go, oh that's nice, let's try and use that and see if we can use it. <laughs> Which is fantastic if you're in the job of selling new shiny tools. Uh, not so good if you're in the job of managing people who like the new shiny tools. So what we normally do... Uh, sorry, I'm just going to open that back up. Um, Thank you. Uh, so what we normally do, where is it? There it is. Uh, is we start out in a region with professional services engagements and training, and then we expand on that. So you know, at the end of the day, we make our money as does Chef by selling licenses for our software. But we start out with communities first, which is part of the reason I'm here tonight. And uh, in the Japanese region, uh, it was discovered in uh, Puppet Labs that. Uh, apparently I'm a subject matter expert on Japan. Uh, I'm pretty sure someone saw... That's uh, not going to come up on the screen. Uh, no. Anyway, so I've, I've been to Japan a few times. Uh, I've holidayed in Japan, I've worked in Japan, and now I'm here again on work a week after I went home from a holiday in Japan. So, <laughs> Uh, word got around that I was something of a subject matter expert, and now I get emails saying, can you please translate these two pages of text into Japanese? Uh, which is not something I want to be doing, and not something <laughs> that any of you want to be reading. 
Uh, for starters, it will all be in Hiragana because I cannot write anything in Kanji. <laughs> but we are coming here more often now. So I will actually be in Japan almost every three months uh, talking to various organizations, not just in Tokyo, but in Osaka as well. Uh, and if I can convince my boss to send me, maybe in Sapporo in the winter with some skis. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, and we're also working throughout Asia uh, on expanding into other areas. So if anyone has any questions about what we're doing or would like to see more, obviously you can come up to me. Uh, are there any questions at the moment on what we're doing within Asia or within Japan in particular? Do you have any brand? Do you have any brand hire somebody? Um, I personally don't want to because then I would not be allowed to keep flying to Japan. <laughs> uh, so what we do have is uh, we're currently working with a couple of organizations that will provide training for us in Japanese uh, because obviously even though organizations like Rakutama or English is the official language, it's still easier if you can do the training in Japanese. Uh, so one of the things that I did actually want to to bring up uh, is that we will be doing more presentations in Japanese as well and I'm getting training and then after the training will come the um, uh, what's um, after that will be the professional services and ultimately hiring in Japan so we'd love to hire someone in Japan but it's a very expensive thing to do and it's very difficult as an American company to hire someone directly so, it's not too weird. I would love it if they just moved me here. I think it would be great. <laughs> uh, what I did, the last thing I did want to do was just show the link to, oops, I would hope if I could remember the difference between a puppet camp and a puppet comp. Uh, did anyone here attend the puppet camp in Tokyo in May? Which one hand up the back? May, yeah, May just got, six months ago. Uh, I saw one or two hands go up. That was, uh, it was on the day I started at Puppet, so I wasn't here, I was in America being uh, in, given all my documentation. Uh, but the, the presentation was done uh, mostly in Japanese uh, by one of my colleagues who actually knows a lot more Japanese than I do, and yet I'm the one they asked to translate. Uh, and it was also, uh, we had quite a few people interested in using Puppet. And so we're trying to form a community, and that's something I'll be talking about on Saturday as well, is building a community to get started. Because I have no illusion that I've spoken to you guys, and next week I'm going to go back to my boss and go, oh, I've got 500,000 sales in Japan. <laughs> but if any of you are interested and want to talk puppet, I'm happy to talk to you. And it takes as long as it takes. So this is the uh, slide, and of course my screen resolution is so low that you can't actually see the URL. But if you do search for Docker Puppet uh, 2014, you will get this uh, slideshow, which was done uh, at our recent conference in San Francisco. So uh, Docker have a couple of employees that are former Puppet people, and they probably have a couple that are former Chef people as well, I imagine. <laughs> it's not like there are that many people you can hire in San Francisco. <laughs> oh. Yes, I'm finished. Any questions? Or a beer? Okay, pizza. Everyone wants pizza and beer, I think. I will be at the pizza and beer, so if you need to talk, if you want to talk to me there, we can talk there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Finally, we have uh, pizza and uh, beer, so uh, let's take a uh, 20 minutes uh, break and, and then the uh, lightning talk will be started. So, uh, have beer and have pizza. Uh, oh, thanks for the chef and the uh, special Okay, thank you.